o así. Y el modo cuando... La No es. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk about our work on secure multi-party computation with free branching. Uh, this is joint work with Matthias Hall Anderson, uh, Aditya Hegde, and Abhishek Jain. Um, so MPC, as we've seen through this day, is uh, a protocol that enables a group of mutually distrusting parties to jointly compute uh, a function over their private inputs while guaranteeing that an adversary who controls a subset of the parties should not learn anything beyond the output of the function. Um, and while there has been tremendous progress uh, in improving the efficiency of MPC uh, protocols, most of the techniques in efficient MPC literature currently uh, rely on a circuit representation of the functions. And the communication complexity in these protocols is typically linear in the size of the circuit. And while there are some protocols that have sublinear communication, those usually rely on heavy computational uh, primitives such as FHE or homomorphic secret sharing schemes, which uh, at least currently are pretty far from being practical. Therefore, uh, in order to efficiently compute a function, uh, what we need is an efficient representation, uh, I'm sorry, an efficient circuit representation of the function. But what if a function doesn't have an efficient circuit representation? Indeed, there are examples of functions that do not have an efficient circuit representation. For example, conditional branches. In conditional branches, uh, evaluating uh, such a function only depends on one of the branches. Um, However, uh, the circuit representation typically needs to encode a description of all of the branches, as a result of which an MPC protocol uh, or naively running an MPC protocol for computing such a function would result in communication that is dependent on the size of all of the branches. Therefore, the question that we ask in this work is whether it's possible to design an efficient MPC protocol for the purpose of securely computing conditional branches, where the total communication only depends on the size of the largest branch. In other words, is it possible to compute conditional branches at the same cost of, for instance, computing a regular circuit of the size of a single branch? But before moving on to any prior work um, in this area, let me try to quickly convince you that computing uh, conditional branches inside MPC efficiently is an interesting problem, which could have potential applications. So it's well known that uh, a control flow instructions um, are, uh, uh, are inevitable in, computing, uh, in computer programs. Um, and prior works have shown that or many forms of control flow instructions can actually be rendered uh, into conditional branches. And these refactorings or renderings usually uh, result in very many um, uh, conditional branches. As a result, designing MPC protocols for uh, conditional branches where the communication cost does not depend on the number of branches would be pretty useful. Um, a more concrete real life application where such a protocol could be used for is, for example, where a collection of servers uh, provide a set of case services together, which the clients can pay for and avail without having to reveal to the servers which service they actually accessed. Okay, so recently uh, some works have uh, addressed the exact same question that we are considering in this work and have managed to make significant progress. In particular, the works by David Heath and Vlad Kolesnikov um, have shown that uh, two party protocols for conditional branches can have communication that is independent of the number of branches uh, in the conditional uh, branching program th uh, that's being evaluated. However, in the end party setting, uh, no such protocol is known. These recent works have managed to reduce the dependence on the number of public key operations, but the total communication in these protocols still depends linearly on the number of branches. Uh, these works overall leave some several interesting open questions. Uh, the first one being, can we design an end party protocol for conditional branches where the total communication is independent of all of the branches? 
Second, uh, all of these prior works only consider security against a semi-honest adversary. And the question that we ask is whether it's possible to also consider uh, protocols with similar efficiency in the militia setting. And finally, these protocols only focus on the Boolean circuit case. Uh, what about protocols for arithmetic circuits? Uh, in this work, uh, we positively resolve almost all of these questions. In particular, we design an n-party protocol uh, where the total communication is independent of the number of branches uh, that are being computed, and our protocol works over arithmetic circuits. Uh, for this protocol, we present variants that have communication complexity both linear and quadratic in the number of parties. We next show that this protocol can also be extended uh, to work in the malicious setting. However, one drawback, draw, drawback of that extension is that it has an additional multiplicative dependence on the statistical security parameter. And finally, we show that this protocol can also be extended to uh, obtain a similar result in the constant uh, round setting, albeit only for uh, Boolean circuits. Uh, due to time constraints uh, in this talk, I'm only going to focus on our first result. Uh, okay, moving on to the ideas that we use uh, to obtain these results. So all of these prior works that I discussed so far rely on the same high level idea. And the idea is to enable all parties to evaluate all of the branches and then to filter out the correct output. In particular, given an input, once the index of the active branch is decided, in this case, three, um, this value is sent to a multiplexer who then forwards the correct input to the active branch and sends some garbage values to the remaining inactive branches. Uh, these branches are then evaluated on the respective inputs and the outputs of these branches are sent to a demultiplexer of sorts, uh, where this demultiplexer also gets the same index of the active branches input and filters out the correct output, that is the output of the active branch uh, and forwards it to the next step of the computation. In our work, we take a slightly different approach. Instead of having to evaluate all of the branches, we consider a strategy where we enable parties to obliviously select the active branch and only require them to evaluate the active branch on the correct inputs. However, since we want the identity or the index associated with the active branch to remain hidden, we would somehow uh, have to enable parties to compute on a hidden function. And this leads uh, me to our uh, initial observation, which is that this problem of computing on a hidden function has uh, some similarity with the problem of private function evaluation. Recall that in private function evaluation, um, only one of the parties knows the function and all of the other parties are in some sense computing in the blind. In our setting, however, nobody knows the, the function that needs to be computed. But uh, the saving grace is that they collectively hold enough information about which function to compute. Uh, and we observe that uh, a particular PFE protocol can actually be modified and adapted to our setting to obtain uh, an efficient protocol for conditional uh, branches. Okay, so the rest of my talk is going to be uh, uh, divided as follows. I'm gonna first uh, start by giving an overview of the PFE protocol by uh, Mohasil and Sadegini. Um, I will then show how we adapt and modify their protocol to our setting. Uh, then I'll discuss uh, sort of the concrete efficiency of our protocol and how it compares to naively uh, computing conditional branches inside um, any state-of-the-art MPC protocol. And then based on uh, if I have time, I can add some remarks about the additional two results that we have. Okay, so the main uh, observation or the starting idea in, in this PFE work is that in order to hide the function that needs to be computed, we need to hide the circuit topology. And to hide the circuit topology, we want to hide the wire configuration of the circuit. That is how the different gates in the circuit interact with each other. And the second thing that we want to hide in order to hide the circuit topology is to hide the function associated with every gate in the circuit. Okay, so now in order to hide the gate functions, the idea used in this work is as follows. 
um, the function holder of uh, the party who holds the function uh, assigns a variable type G to every gate in the circuit. And this variable is set to a value zero if the gate is a multiplication gate, and it's set to one if the gate is an addition gate. It then secret shares these types for every gate amongst all of the remaining parties. And now assuming that uh, the parties somehow get shares of the uh, input wire values of this uh, for this particular gate, they can compute both an addition and a multiplication on these left and right input wire values. And based on the, the type of the gate, choose the appropriate operation. And since this computation requires parties to work over shares, uh, we want to use any underlying MPC protocol that is able to compute on shares. And, and we know that most existing efficient MPC protocols do indeed work over shares. Uh, but this, this particular description makes a simplifying assumption that the parties already start with an additive sharing of the left and right input wire values to every gate. Uh, but it's unclear how they actually obtain this because all but one party is don't even know what the wire configuration and the circuit are. Uh, which brings me to the next idea in this paper that is enabling parties to determine additive shares of the input uh, inputs to every gate while uh, keeping the wire configuration of the circuit hidden. Their protocol proceeds in two steps. In the pre-processing phase, the function holding party starts by assigning incoming labels to every wire in the circuit. This incoming label is in some sense associated with the gate uh, to which this wire goes as input to. They also assign an outgoing label to every wire, uh, which is associated with the gate that this wire comes as output from. Based on these incoming and outgoing labels assigned to every wire, they define a mapping, uh, let's call it pi. And simultaneously, the remaining parties, that is the non-function holding parties, sample random uh, masks for every wire in the circuit. Let's call these the incoming mask and the outgoing mask. Uh, after this, the, the, the parties interact with each other, at the end of which the function holding party is able to learn uh, the delta value, which is the difference between the incoming wire mask and the outgoing wire mask associated with every wire in the circuit. This delta value is then used in the online phase to enable parties to evaluate the circuit without leaking the wire configuration to them. So let's, let's say we have a gate G, which has incoming wire values uh, with incoming labels A and B, and an outgoing wire that has an outgoing label C. And I'm using ZA, ZB, and ZC to denote the actual uh, wire values uh, induced in these wires as a result of the computation. Now, after we are done evaluating this gate G, the parties are going to add the outgoing mask associated with the outgoing wire of this gate to the, the ZC value that was computed as an output of this gate. And they reconstruct this value. And for computing the gate G itself, the function holding party uh, identifies the correct masked inputs to this gate and adds the delta value that we computed in the pre-processing phase to these values and sends this added value to the remaining parties. The remaining parties can now simply subtract the incoming masks from these A and B values to get the, the additive shares of the actual values on which this gate G needs to be evaluated on. And again, this uh, I'd just like to reiterate that this is a general compiler that can work uh, on any uh, MPC protocol that is capable of working over uh, shares. Um, uh, I, I'm now going to talk about how we can adapt this exact protocol to our setting to get uh, a protocol uh, for uh, evaluating conditional branches where the total communication does not depend on the size of all branches. Okay, so starting with uh, how to evaluate a gate while hiding the gate function, let's assume that the parties have an additive sharing of the unary representation of the index associated with the active branch, that is the branch that we want to evaluate. And assuming there are k branches, we assume that the parties have additive shares of bits b1 to bk. They can now use these shares of B1 to BK and take a linear combination with the different types of the Gth gate in every branch to obtain an additive sharing of the type G of the active branch. 
And since this is just a linear uh, combination, the step doesn't require any communication. Now, once we have uh, additive shares of the type of every gate in the active branch, as before, assuming that the parties already have additive shares of the left and right input wire values to every gate, they can perform a similar operation as before to uh, get additive shares for the outgoing wire of every gate. And note that this particular step, because it requires parties to first compute the addition and multiplication operations and then perform a selection process, requires two times the amount of communication and computation as uh, the size of one branch. But again, the, the question that still remains is how the, how, how the parties actually obtain additive shares of the left and right input wire values to every gate in the active branch. Um, uh, similar to the PFE protocol that we just discussed, we'll, we'll have a separate pre-processing phase and a separate online phase. So in the pre-processing phase now, because the parties already know all of the branches, all the parties can assign separate incoming and outgoing wire labels to every wire in every branch. And this gives us a separate mapping pi i for every branch uh, that we are considering in our conditional branches. Uh, these parties, like before, also share incoming and outgoing random masks, but they do this only once. They only sample one set of masks. They don't do this for every branch separately. These masks will be reused for every branch. And again, since we only uh, sample one set of masks, the communication required uh, or incurred uh, in sampling these masks is again independent of the uh, number of branches in the circuit. Now, given these incoming masks and the outgoing masks, what we want is to compute a sharing of appropriately permuted outgoing masks associated with every wire in the active branch. And this can be done by taking a linear combination with the shares, the bit shares of B1 to BK, which is the unary representation of the index associated with the active branch. But since this step requires us to actually multiply shares uh, this will uh, naively doing this will incur communication and computation that depends on the size of all branches uh, in our program, which we'd like to avoid. Uh, but let's 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 assume that we are able to do this efficiently. Now, if we have this sharing, it's easy to compute the delta value as before. We simply subtract this permuted outgoing mask from the incoming mask to get the delta value associated with every wire in the active branch. So the question that remains in the pre-processing phase is how do we efficiently compute this inner product step? Uh, for this, uh, we, we, we will rely on threshold linearly homomorphic encryption. Uh, and the protocol proceeds as follows. We start by computing encryptions of the bits associated with the, uh, with the index of the active branch. Every party uses its share, every party encrypts its share of every uh, bit individually and sends it or broadcasts it to every other party. Every other party then uh, takes a linear combination of these shares with their shares of the appropriately permuted outgoing masks in every branch. This gives them uh, an encryption of the shares of the permuted outgoing masks for the active uh, branch. Uh, once we aggregate all of these encryptions, we get an encryption of the outgoing masks that is appropriately permuted according to the mapping of the active branch. And now we can simply decrypt this uh, to obtain shares of the appropriately permuted outgoing masks, where the mapping uh, that's used in this permutation depends on the, uh, on, on the wire configuration of the active branch. Again here, note that the communication here is only required for communicating encryptions of B1 to BK values, which are independent of the size of the branches. Only, they only depend on the number of branches. And in the aggregation step, which again only depends on the size of one branch. Uh, this uh, brings me to the end of the uh, pre-processing phase. Now, given that we have additive shares uh, of the delta values associated with every wire in the, in the active branch, we can now use that to proceed in the online phase as follows. Um, again, as before, we have this gate G that has these uh, incoming and outgoing wires. Um, similar to before, after computing the gate G, uh, parties uh, add the outgoing 
uh, uh, sorry, mask the output of this gate with the appropriate outgoing mask and reconstruct this masked value. Now for computing G, what we want is to identify the correct U pi A value, which is the, the appropriate masked input wire value. Earlier in the PFE setting, we relied on the function holding party to, to send this to us. But here, since none of the parties know this, uh, what we're going to do is we are again going to rely on the additive shares of the index uh, associated with the active branch that we have and take a linear combination um, of these uh, additive shares with the UPI values associated with every uh, branch to actually get the, the, the right masked value for the active branch. And this, this can be repeated as is to compute uh, shares of the UPI B value. And, and as before, given the shares of these A and B values, we can subtract the appropriate incoming mass to get shares of the actual uh, additive shares of the actual input wire values to this gate G on which we'd like to evaluate the gate. And as before, similar to the PFE protocol, this approach can work with any MPC protocol that is capable of operating over shares. Okay, so given um, uh, this protocol, let's now see how it compares to just naively computing conditional branches mm -hmm. uh, using a state-of-the-art MPC protocol. Um, I think you're slowly running over time, so maybe if you can sum this up quickly. Sure. Uh, so yeah, so we compare it to mascot, uh, which is a dishonest majority protocol that has a quadratic dependence on the number of parties. And as you can see, the communication complexity in our protocol pretty much remains consistent as the number of party as the number of branches increase. Um, and similarly, the runtime of our protocol also doesn't increase uh, with as much rate as uh, just naively running. Uh, conditional branches inside mascot. And we do a similar comparison with CDN, which is a dishonest majority protocol that only has a linear dependence on the number of parties. Um, finally, uh, we, we show that this protocol can also be extended to the malicious setting. Um, and we also give a constant round uh, variant uh, by relying on a multi-party gobbling approach. Thank you. I think we have time for one quick question. So first of all, thanks for the nice talk. David. Thank you for this. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I was just curious if you had the opportunity to do a concrete comparison with the prior work on MPC free branching. Uh, uh, like stand gobbling and stuff? Uh, the the multi-party variants that the reduce the number of public key operations. <laughs> Right. Uh, so the communication complexity in our case will be will be better because mm -hmm. our communication complexity is really better. And I believe we did. Uh, I don't think we, we put the graphs in the paper for the actual runtime, but even our runtime was actually uh, not that bad okay. in comparison to to the motif paper is, right. I think, uh, what we compared to. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Arushi. Thank